Welcome to this week's Cool Tool Show and Tell. Our special guest this week is Graham Briggs. Hey, Graham, would you like to introduce yourself to our listeners and watchers? Sure. Hi, Kevin. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, my name is Graham Briggs. Um, I'm originally from England, as you might tell from the accent. Uh, right now, I live in Japan. I've lived here for about uh, most of the last 20 years. Um, and by trade, I'm an engineer. Welcome, Graham. From far away, we're virtually close. I appreciate your volunteering, your time, and your um, love for cool tools. And so, um, what's first in your pile today? What what's a tool you want to share with us? Okay, the first one. Um, I'm a keen motorcyclist. Uh, a lot of places in the world are best seen from two wheels, in my opinion. So, my first cool tool actually is related to the helmet. Um, I'm holding up right now as a full face helmet, as you can probably see there. This is my uh, my trusty Arai. Uh, Astro GX helmet, but my actual cool tool is more related to the visor. Might be a little bit difficult to show, but I'm going to try here. Uh, if you actually look on the visor itself, you'll see a small white line around it, and a small. This is the white line, kind of here. I see. Okay, so yep. you're holding up a helmet. A yep, white it's a helmet, standard crash helmet, like a big motorcycle helmet. And it has a clear, yep. clear visor in yep. front of it, and then there's a white edge around the perimeter of the visor. Yep. Okay. That's right. And what's special about that? So this is what's called a pin lock. Um, it's mainly for full face helmets like this, meaning that it has a large chin bar here. Um, so what a pin lock is, when you buy a motorcycle visor, most of the time, it's a single piece of, of plastic. It's usually clear or smoked, depending on what you like. Uh, but it's only one layer of kind of plastic polycarbonate, meaning that quite often, uh, depending on the weather conditions, depending on how you're breathing, uh, the inside of the helmet can mist up quite a uh -huh. lot. Um, so what a pin lock is, is it's an it's a plastic, single piece of plastic insert, and the white is actually a small layer of like urethane rubber that goes around the outside, and you put it on the inside of the visor that comes with the helmet, and it creates like a like a double glazing effect, like a, an air gap between the two layers of plastic. And it's called pin lock because there are two small single turn screws on either side of the visor, which you turn that locks it in place. And what it does is it creates that that air gap, that kind of thermal barriers, which greatly reduces the amount of fogging up that okay. happens in your helmet. Um, so it's an anti-fogging device. It prevents fogging, internal yes. fogging inside your um, otherwise fairly airtight uh, shield. So yeah. um, that's interesting. And also, I guess it would make it easy to replace the outside if it should get scratched or bugged up or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's um, You can separate it again and put it back on. Um, you do need to have a Pinlock compatible visor. Most mid-range helmets seem to come with Pinlock compatible visors right now, uh, but you can buy them separately. You can buy the insert separately from, from uh, the visor itself. So. And are the, are the inserts kind of a standard size, or do you need to find an insert for your particular helmet? You need to get them specific for your visor shape. Okay. Um, sometimes different manufacturers will share the same visor shape across different models, but you do need to to make sure that yours is compatible with the visor itself. Okay. So it's double paned yep. visors that are anti fog. It's interesting, right. and and uh, it, but it's not like a vacuum seal, like a um, no. like an actual double pane window. It would be no. There's no there's no vacuum. It is literally just air gapped. Effectively, uh, you can put the insert in yourself. Um, I would recommend getting the shop to do it where you buy it. Um, because doing it yourself can be a little bit fiddly, uh, the first time you do it. That was certainly my experience. Um, but it really, it does work. Um, Pinlock do sell different grades, uh, for different weather conditions. Oh, I have them. So the visor is made by the, the Pinlock people themselves. So it's, it's a, it's a brand and a system. Yes. Yes. Um, some motorcycle manufacturer, uh, helmet manufacturers do, kind of brand their own visors, but all the inserts themselves seem to be made by Pinlock. Okay. And why don't the original visor manufacturers produce it from the get-go if it's that much better? That is a very good question. Um, I think this kind of idea is very simple. It's quite an old idea from the, uh, certainly in the ski and the snowboard world, you know, uh -huh. to have double, double paned uh, goggles, for example, but it doesn't seem to have become the standard yet in the motorcycle world. 
uh, which is a real shame because there's plenty of motorcyclists around the world. We we have, especially when you stop at traffic lights or if you have to stop at a junction or something, and you you don't have the airflow through the helmet, it starts steaming up quite quickly. I see, and it starts fogging up. So. Mm. Uh, it's a very useful day-to-day kind of tool that we kind of forget about. Uh, okay. But yeah, I, I don't know why it's not more standard in, in helmet design. Okay. Um, and just for orientation purposes, the the cost of the additional layer, what, what does that go for? So depending on the model uh, and depending on what which level of, of fog resistance mm-hmm. um, you go for with a pin lock, it can go from anything uh, in US dollars from thirty-five, forty up to nearly $100. Okay. So already. Okay, so um Graham, what's um what's the second tool for you? All right, second tool. Let me just move my helmet out of the way. <laughs> uh the second tool is also uh motorcycle related while we're on that theme. Um so what I'm holding up now is what looks like a big black bag. Um it's made by a company called a big black bag <laughs> with a lot of big black bag. It. So um what that actually was, it's a motorcycle cover. Ah. Um and the reason I, I list it as a cool tool is I, I don't think motorcycle covers get the credit they deserve. Okay. Um, tragically, my motorcycle has to live outside, uh, meaning I, I want to protect it from the elements, um, which around here isn't so much cold. It's mainly rain. We have a pretty intense rainy season. Uh, we also get typhoons later in the year uh, and some wind. So the good thing about this motorcycle cover is um, it has an elastic skirt around the bottom when you put it over the motorcycle, so it keeps mm-hmm. it tight into the bike, so wind isn't as much of a problem. It has a strap that goes under the motorcycle, so even okay. if the wind does catch it, uh, it doesn't fly off the bike. Uh, and of course, the main thing is it protects the bike from the rain, uh, and it also protects it from the sun. And specific to this cover, during rainy season here, it rains for two or three days at a time. Um, so you need something that really is going to keep that water out, but you also need something that's going to dry quickly afterwards. Um, so it's not just sat there kind of wet on top of the bike. Uh, and the Nelson Reed cover does that really well. Uh, the model I have is the Defender Extreme. So inside that bag, there's like a material piece that goes over where the windscreen on my bike would be, which means that the windscreen doesn't get scratched uh, as the cover moves around uh, over the bike. So there's a lot of things to recommend this cover specifically. Um, but I would say it's also good just to have a bike cover anyway. Uh, again, mm-hmm. it keeps the sun off it, stops sun damage and damage to the rubber parts and things like that. Um, and it also, it, it's not a problem for me personally, but you know, if you live in an area where motorcycles get stolen or get taken now and then, uh, it kind of anonymizes the bike quite well as well. You know, so it, it draws less attention if uh, if that's a particular problem for you. So. And um, is this a particular brand that you are recommending? So yeah, Nelson Rig, which I think is actually based out of the States. Um, those are the ones I've ended up with, uh, again, because they they provide all the protection I want. It dries quickly. It doesn't attract cats, which I've had with previous bike covers for some reason. Why, why does not it? How does it prevent cats from... I, I think it's just a little bit too slippery for them to, to sit on. I see. Uh, and get their claws into, uh, which I've had with previous covers where the cats would just kind of sit on there and just claw it to death. And- uh-huh, 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 I see. And um, what about other vermin? Does it, um, I know, I don't know what we are, but often in the States, in the West, there's a problem with cars that are sitting around and mice or rats getting inside and making home there. Does does this do anything this way? I've not had that problem. Okay. Um, now and then you'll get some interesting insects decide to set up home. Uh, but yeah, nothing too dangerous, fortunately. So yeah. Um, so does how quick can you kind of uncover it and whatnot? Like if you, is it kind of an ordeal to take the cover off and put it away and unstrap everything? Does it, is it like 10 minutes longer? No. No, it's it's less than a minute on my bike, to be honest. Um, okay. And my bike's quite difficult because it's quite angular in places. Um, so yeah, this one's actually really easy to just kind of slide on and off and get that strap okay. under it. It's really not too difficult, which is nice. Yes. Yeah. When you the think it's going to start raining. Yeah, I guess if you have to store it outside, I guess that makes sense. And it presumably would work with snow as well. Yeah. Yeah, we get a small amount of snow each year. Yeah. Um, the Nelson um motorcycle covers okay so so graham um what's your third tool okay the third one is uh from another kind of hobby that i have which is photography okay uh, not quite as accomplished as you on this but uh this is a a monopod mm. uh, 
So I'm kind of holding up what looks like a, a stick, which is, I guess, about 15 inches long, something like that. It's about 40 centimeters. A little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it telescopes. It's, it's like one half of a ski pole. kind. Yes. Of. Yes. It does look very much like a ski pole. Um, one end of it, there are three kind of buckles. Uh, and you kind of ratchet them up and then you can extend it. This is uh, telescoping. And three, yeah. So it basically telescopes out. Um, this one is made by Monfro Manfrotto. Um, it has three hinges, so at full extension, it's about 60 inches long, right? Uh, about 1.5 meters, something like that. Um, and obviously, it's a monopod, so it's really for a camera, basically. Uh, and it, I don't know if you can see this very right, well. There's a little one quarter twenty screw at the yep. top. Yep, it's got a standard screw insert for the bottom of a, a camera, be it a video camera or a stills camera. Um, I bought this many years ago on the recommendation of a friend for uh, kids sports events mainly to put the camera on and kind of hold it and pan uh, kind of with it. Um, it takes a lot of stress off your hands. Right, right. In the so, meantime, so, I found- so, just, just to clarify, you're using it instead of a tripod with the three yep. legs, this is like a tripod with one leg. Yep. So you can hold the camera fairly steady, not steady as a tripod, but steady yep. enough with your hand and that one the one foot. Yeah, that's right. It's um. It's pretty good for panning. Obviously, if you lean to one side, it's a bit of a problem. Uh, if you have a lens which is not stabilized, it does help a little bit mm -hmm. uh, in that scenario. It's a lot less bulky than a tripod. Right. Uh, and again, if I want to put it on my bicycle or, or the motorcycle, right, it's right. pretty easy to kind of get on there. Um, I found multiple other uses for this over the years, I have to admit. Um, because it's it's kind of telescoped um, with an adapter, you can put like a GoPro or some other action camera or even your, your cell phone, I guess, Make on the end and use it as kind of a selfie stick. Yeah. Yeah, um, which is useful. Um, this one specifically, the Manfrotto ones, I'm not quite sure how well this is going to show up, but the top, maybe seven or eight inches, has actually got a foam uh, piece on the actual stick itself, uh, which is good for kind of holding. So when you extend it, you can use it as some kind of walking uh, aid as well, right. uh, which I've done. Uh, like I've a also. Hiking, like a hiking pole. Yeah, like a hiking pole. I have also used it to hold up part of tarps and tents and things like that on camping mm -hmm. trips when things have gone wrong. Uh, so it truly is a multifunction device. Um, but yeah, primarily I use it for uh, for just uh, camera work and things like that if I'm trying to just get a steady shot in difficult terrain and things like right. that. Right. So. That kind of just gave me an idea of adding a tripod screw to the top of my hiking poles. I never thought about that. But that's, yeah. that's um, a possibility. Um, it would not be as substantial as the mono, no. mono but it would be... Um, uh, it may be enough. Um, so the uh, some people also these days um, make a, a homemade stand for the bottom of the monopod and use it. Like the YouTubers use it in their workshops. Wow, oh, cool! If they're filming yourself, and a work a tripod can just take up so much room in yeah. in, in the workshop. But uh, if you can make a little foot. Sure. For the monopod, um, it's often enough, maybe if you're using a camera or some other lightweight camera uh, or a phone, you can um, make it a monopod with a foot that self-stands. Oh, nice. Yeah, I should look into that. Yeah. Um, yeah, this this one obviously is very basic. Uh, it's made of aluminium. Um, I guess as you spend more money, you can get carbon fiber ones right. as well. And, and like you say, the models that maybe have feet that would freestand, that'd be nice. But um, but yeah, this is a uh, it served me well now for quite a few years. I've been quite pleased with it. It was a good investment. Yeah, it's really great. Um, and it looks like it uh, telescopes and untelescopes very easily. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, again, I, I've had this for quite a long time, and I've still had zero problems. Yeah, you know, with any of the fasteners or the sliding or anything. So, right. yeah, it's uh, been a pretty good model. Well, thank you for that. Um, okay, Graham. So your fourth tool. So my fourth tool is actually a, a website. Um, the site is called Curviger. Uh, D E K U R V I G E R. D E. So Curviger basically is is a mapping uh, route planning system, if you like. Um, it's very popular amongst quite a few uh, motorcyclists again, um, for reasons I will explain. Um, there are plenty of ways of planning routes. Obviously, Google Maps will let you do it. There's quite a few other systems. So the reason I use this one is it uses the OpenStreetMap mapping system, mm -hmm. which is the same as the software that I use uh, on the bike itself. 
Um, but it also has varying degrees of how you would like to get there. So what I've done here is I've selected two starting, uh, I've selected a starting point here, Odawara, which is a, a town just down the coast. It's quite nice. Uh, and to finish in Hamamatsu, which is where my motorcycle was made. Uh, it's the Yamaha factory. And if we look over here on the left, there are different routes that you can take from the fastest route, uh, fast and curvy, uh, and there's these ratings. For oh, route. I see. So, for example, if we if we just take one step away from like the fast motorway route, uh, you can see though that it changes quite a lot, starts taking us through more curvy mountains. I see. Uh, and then it gets progressively uh, more curvy. curvy. So and that's then the like last Okay. Yeah. So oh, and you can see the route here also has gone from 180 kilometers up to you know nearly 400 kilometers. So. Right. So 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 I see. So this is the and and, and the idea is is that motorcyclists like curves. Yep. Why is that? Um, curves are just a lot more fun on most bikes. I'm not going to say all bikes. Um, and what obviously what you can't see too easily on this map is Japan's a very uh, 3D country. You have a lot of mountains here. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to get on a, on a bike and really kind of lean into corners and really kind of see some beautiful scenery uh, through the mountains, um, this is an easy way for you to find a route to get okay. you from A to B. Um, and, and, and does it work worldwide? It does, yeah, yeah. It's... Um, it pretty much covers everything you see all. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can. I, I could do my home country uh, in the UK if I wanted uh, to, uh, and obviously over here in the states as well. We can kind of zoom in and it'll give you the same detail. Arkansas and the Ozarks, which is pretty yeah. curvy. There's lots of uh, yeah. What, what happens if you do in the Ozarks? Just just take an example. So you're 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 you switched over to um, somewhere in the US, and we're going to take a random state, Ozar, the Arkansas. Yeah. And um, from hot springs to um, Arkadella, I think whatever. So, yes, we could do we could do a start point start, here, right? And then somewhere south, Arkadella, Arkadelphia. Yeah, there you go. What does it say? The curviest way <laughs> set us end. Yeah. So as you can see there. Um, so we're seeing it builds a, it builds a route which yep. is um looks like not quite on the highways but bigger roads yeah and then if we go to just the fastest route it'll just take you straight down that highway okay all right so uh, yeah it's uh it's a good way to kind of build a route if you want to go out um uh -huh. but you don't have time to kind of pick individual roads yourself you you can you can set different waypoints and do that um, and you, so the site is this a free site is this a subscription like all trails um, how does it work so there is uh there is a free version uh which i'm actually using uh and even on the free version you can save your routes uh on their server if you uh -huh. like um you can also pay i think they call it curviga tora which gives you access to like a, an additional level of of curviness <laughs> uh, if you want that uh <laughs> I'm I'm seriously thinking about joining that because uh, I've had a lot of value out of this site. Uh, it's introduced uh -huh. me to modes that I would never have thought of going down otherwise. Okay. Um, and I guess one of the important things for me is you can export really easily from this website, uh, and it will export as either a route or a track in GPX and some other formats. I use yeah. GPX tracks for more detail, uh, and they're compatible with the software that I use on my smartphone as a navigation system on the bike. So, so you use... So the bike itself doesn't have navigation. You use the phone just like on a mountain. Front yeah, of yeah. My bike doesn't have it. So I, I've got an old smartphone, um, uh -huh. and I just load the maps up on that over Wi-Fi. Okay. Uh, and then uh, all the maps are downloaded onto the phone anyway. All so, right. Okay. Um, and and as a GPX in which you can just import into like Google or Apple Maps, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's cool. Okay, so so the curvy. So, have you heard of other people? I mean, like uh, I'm a bicyclist. Rather, my bikes are different for me. They're 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 you know, pedaled, where we don't necessarily optimize curves. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if if um you find other people using this besides motorcyclists. Um, I I've a couple of friends who are cyclists uh, do use this, um, because you can also factor in and it'll also show um kind of elevation uh, as well so they can they can plan a route and kind of say okay well this is going to be a bit of a climb and this is going to be down and you know and i, I guess elevation certainly when i'm cycling elevation is a very right, big right, right. so maybe you want to minimize elevation right 
Um, and again, Japan is fairly 3D, certainly where I am. Right. So uh, knowing what elevation to expect is a very useful thing to have. Okay. Uh, less of a concern when you have a motor, but <laughs> sure. so people power is a little bit different. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's great. So 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 Graham, what, what, what tell us about um, what you're interested in these days, or what excites you, or what you're working on, or what? Um, I'm always looking for new places to go and see. Um, I've been trying to plan a trip to an interesting place to see the Aurora Borealis, which is my current travel. On a motorcycle. Um, undecided right now mm. on that one. It, it could be an option depending on what the family say. But um, as far as just uh, actual projects that I'm working on right now, um, improving my photography is something that I wanted to do this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I decided not to buy any hardware this year, but to put that money into like skills training. Uh, mm -hmm. And a couple of months ago, uh, I went out and did a, a photo walk of uh, Tokyo, mm -hmm. a night photo walk of Tokyo uh, with a, a guy uh, called Ivan, who's, a, who's a, a great guide around a city that I thought I knew. And he showed me a whole bunch of different places. But more than that, he kind of taught me how to take better photos, got me into manual mode on my photo, on my camera mm -hmm. a little bit more. Uh, so he was teaching me that. So I'm going to try and do another course for that. That's kind of a goal for the rest of this year, for the second half. Um, because I, I really want to improve my camera skill set. Right now, I just have hundreds of snaps of yeah, my yeah. bike in front of things. Um, so I want to improve that. Yeah, no, take, learning skills and taking workshops and classes is really undervalued. One of our previous Cool Tools guests did something. She actually ran a little site called Dapple. Okay. Dabble, 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 dabble where she was oh, dabbling. Right, yeah. Basically, she was like, I'm going to learn a new thing. I take one class once a month for like yeah. years and years. And um, that was her her joy, even and kind of like a, it wasn't that expensive in the end. It was just I'm going to devote myself to try and learn new things once a month. And um, she kept track of them with this website called Dabble, um, where she was taking classes, experiences, and um, courses, which um, again. They were kind of around us, but we don't think of them that often. And I'm really glad that you're taking the the night photography one. That sounds like a great idea. Yeah, it was it was really challenging. Um I, I know certainly with what was challenging about it. So I, I don't do a lot of street photography and I don't do a lot of night photography. Uh I tend to stay in auto mode and maybe the A mode and that's about it. Right. And we spent quite a lot of time talking about you know, adjusting your ISO, adjusting kind of the aperture to account for, obviously in Tokyo, you've got the very bright neon and the very dark spots. Right. And so how do you get that dynamic range in there? Right. Uh, which is stuff I, I'd never really looked at seriously before. Yeah. Uh, but he made it very engaging. Uh, and Tokyo is a very dynamic kind of city to photograph. Right. So, um, yeah, it was uh, a good learning experience. And, you know, after that course, I've tried as much as I can to kind of get out in those scenarios mm -hmm. uh, and practice so I don't forget what I learned on the course. Yes, that's um, important. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely looking for another course. I might go with the, the same company again because they were really good. It wasn't just showing you good places to get photos, but how to take a good photo when you're mm -hmm. there. That's um, fabulous. Good so. for them. What was the uh, – do you remember what the company was called? Uh, I think it's called IPD, I want to say. IPD, okay. Yeah. So uh, was that a, just a, a Japan based or was this? Uh, um, the the chap that runs it actually, ironically, is from just down the road from where I'm from in the UK. Uh -huh. uh, but he's he's been in Japan for like 30 years um, and uh, kind of knows the area very well. He spent all that time in Tokyo. Okay. So uh, yeah, he's uh, there's quite a few companies that do photo uh, walks and photo tours around Tokyo. Uh, like I say, I chose this one because uh, I met the guy and he's a very good kind of teacher yeah. as well as somebody to kind of show you around. So That's really great. Um, but yeah, well, I wish you fantastic success in whatever courses or classes you take in the coming future because um, I should do more myself. It's a really, it's a great reminder to, to um, the opportunity we have it's a real great great way to learn something because you can get to try it and to see whether it fits yeah. and before you kind of plunge into buying tools whatever you can oftentimes use whatever the school the courses or the sure. workshop or the teacher is using and that's a way to try things out yeah i i think with photography it's very easy to just think oh i'll buy a better camera and that'll make me a better yeah. for the you know. well you, you, as you can see working with someone who's really good it's as as lance armstrong kept saying it's not the bike it's not the camera 
it's the eye and person behind Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, great. Graham, thank you for taking time and sharing your cool tools with us. We oh. really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Much appreciated. This year, our cool tools blog will be 20 years old, which means we've been posting something new every day for 20 years. It's only possible because of the very engaged and knowledgeable readers and listeners like yourself. You've kept this place going, and we are very grateful for you. With this idea of 20 years in mind, um, we decided to try an experiment this year, and I'm inviting our guests and listeners to join me on our Cool Tool Show and Tell, which is the program that you're listening to right now. So if you feel you'd make a good guest on this podcast and have four uncommon tools that you'd like to share with us, um, please sign up on our form on the website and we'll see about inviting you. You must be comfortable taking on, talking on a video and um, you need to have some tools that you can show um, we record on, as you know, on Zoom. We do a YouTube version, a visual video version of it, as well as an audible version. Fill out the form if you're interested and um, list your four, four cool tools and we'll see if there's a good fit. The applications aren't guaranteed in any way. Um, and we're looking at tools that are new to us and appropriate tools and um, whether the times will work for you. So um, we're really interested in hearing from people all over the world, not just in the U.S., although the tools have to be available online, easily available online. And um, if you are a longtime listener, you kind of know what the definition of our tools are. They're very broad. They can be anything that's handy, from something in the kitchen to something you use to travel to a workshop to something professional that we may not know about. We're really interested in things that we don't know anything about. So um, this is an open invitation. We'll give it a try. If you think you make a good guess for this podcast, um, fill out the form. There'll be a link somewhere on our website. Um, and we look forward to, to chatting with you. Thank you.